All right. The title of this message is The Apostle to the Greeks. It's a familiar story. You've heard it many times. I had heard it many times. But it seems like as you go through Scripture it, and get older and whatnot, it, it comes alive more. So um, we're going to start in Mark 4.35, kind of have a lot of verses to cover. I put them all on the screen so you don't have to flip along all from the New American Standard Version. So here's my thesis for today. The thesis is in three parts, and Jesus had compassion not only for the Jews, but for the lost in all the world. Okay, that's not very controversial. And he wanted to reach the lost in a particular area, but they had a worldview that was totally alien to that of the Jews. Not unlike what we're experiencing today when we talk to people sometimes. So here's what he decided to do. He decided to use one person, probably the least likely person, with a terrible reputation and no theological training to topple that worldview and upend a culture with the result that many came to know him. Fascinating story. So we need a little background. So these events happen pretty early in Jesus' ministry. Um, he, we know he had been teaching even before his public ministry began. And the thing that was remarkable at the way Jesus taught was he taught with authority. He's not going to teach the way I teach because I'll say, well, this is kind of what I think it means, or, you know, I talked to Chuck and, or Fred, you know, but Jesus never did that. He never said, well, you really need to go ask the rabbi about that. His, his hermeneutic and his exegesis were perfect, and his eisegesis and his exegesis were the same thing. What he said it said and what he thought it said were two in the, two in the same thing. He was unquestioned authority on Scripture. But he wrote it. His first public sign was the wedding feast there at Cana. And uh, he only had a few disciples at that point. I think he only had a few. I, I don't think he showed up with 700 you know, or 70 at a wedding. Because it says in John chapter 2 that Mary was at the wedding and Jesus and his disciples were invited. And you know what happened? They ran out of wine. And he, he saw the the big clay jars that they use for a Jew Jewish purification rite, and he changed that water into wine. Nobody really saw it except for a few of his disciples. And that was the first public sign that he did. So he had a few disciples. They probably heard him in the synagogue as he would teach, and they were kind of impressed by what he was saying, and they followed him, maybe just a handful. Then, one day... I think he's in Capernaum, and he casts out a demon in the middle of teaching on the Sabbath. And you can read about it in Mark chapter 1, 23, 26. And the, the demon approached him and said, What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? We know who you are, the Holy One of God. This was kind of a watershed moment in Christ's ministry because of what happened next. So... So he left the synagogue, and they went to Peter's house, where, if you remember, uh, Peter's mother-in-law had a fever, and he healed her. Then, since it was the Sabbath, you can't walk very far on the Sabbath, and at sundown, when sundown came, that was the end of the Sabbath, then many came to the house for healing and casting out a demon. So this was the start of it right here, the very first time that he did something publicly that really got people's attention. And his popularity grew from that point to the point where he couldn't even enter a town publicly. And he couldn't even eat a meal, it said. There was just a line of people coming into the house and you can imagine them trying to eat and there's constant interruptions. His family, when they heard about it, they grew so concerned that they came to take custody of him. They thought that he had, something is wrong with Jesus. They tried to Baker act him, basically. 
Now, he could have basked in that popularity, but instead, he was purposefully confrontational and clashed with the religious authorities. At one time, there was a man, uh, and Jesus said to him, uh, my, son, my child, your sins are forgiven. He was going to heal him, but he said, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and scribes are like, this man is saying that you can't forgive sins. And then he questioned them. He said, what's easier, to heal a man or to forgive his sins? And then another time, there was a man with a withered hand, and they were watching closely. Here's a multitude following Jesus. They love him, and the Pharisees are looking to for anything he does wrong that they can discredit him. So the man comes forward, and Jesus poses the question, is it, is it, is it right to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? Because they were watching to see if he was going to heal somebody on the Sabbath, breaking their law. So he told the man, stretch out your hand. And, of course, it was restored and he was healed. Um, then his disciples, would, as they're walking through a field, they would grab grains of, uh, of wheat and eat it. Another breaking of the Sabbath, quote-unquote, according to their laws. So you have this <laughs> confrontation. Then he taught the people through parables, and a lot of times he would kind of work his way along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, oftentimes from a boat, because you can picture the shoreline kind of sloping up, and he would say, have a boat ready, and I'll get in the boat a little ways off the shore, and then I can address everybody. And by the way, the Sea of Galilee is, is not really a sea, what we think about, it's fresh water, not salt water. So here's where we pick up. Mark 4.35, and on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. And to really understand the significance of what that statement is, you have to know a little history and a little geography. So here's the history. If you remember back in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of a statue, and the head is gold which was Nebuchadnezzar's empire, the uh, Babylonians. Then it had breast and arms of silver. That was the Medo-Persian uh, empire. Then it had belly and thighs of bronze, and that was the Greek empire. And think Alexander the Great, 12 years of conquering the known world. And then following that, the legs of iron, the feet mixed with clay, uh, the Roman empire. So, and I'm really thankful to Chuck because he's been just going over this for a good month about the Greek Empire. And because it's in that, uh, it's at that intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we don't know much about it except for, for secular history, but it had a huge impact on the New Testament world. Uh, it was, and for one reason is that Greek culture had spread all along the Mediterranean and a lot of Jews actually syncretized Judaism and Hellenism. They kind of replaced Jehovah with Zeus, and it was that kind of go along to get along. The Greeks are in power. I'm going to kind of, you know, if I want to stay high priest, I better go along with the program. And you can read about that. Hellenized Jews are mentioned uh, in Acts. The Torah which is uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, was transferred into, uh, translated into Greek uh, during the Greek Empire. We call that the Septuagint. And I think they really just wanted it for their library in Alexandria, where they had this huge library of all the ancient uh, documents. And the, the Torah was significant. Um, but there was a side effect to that. And that is that if you think about the old Roman writings, the Iliad, the Odyssey, is that Greek or Roman? I don't know. Mike knows. Um, you, you think about those stories. Now think about Ruth. Okay? There's a depth to God's Word, the Scriptures, that once it was translated into Greek, it opened up the scriptures to all of the civilized world, basically. Otherwise, it would have been in Hebrew or Aramaic, totally cut off to them. The, the Jewish religion probably would have disappeared like all the other Canaanite religions that had their, their gods, but it didn't. 
And one of the things the Greeks did is they let soldiers uh, colonize the areas that they had conquered. It was very common for a soldier to say, oh, I can get some acreage over in Judea. And that was very attractive to them. And one such area was called the Decapolis. And if you look in the map there in the lower corner, you see Decapolis, it's kind of a brown color. You see the Sea of Galilee. There's a little town called Gergesa right here. This is all the Decapolis. There's Capernaum right there. And Decapolis means 10 cities. And they were Hellenistic. They, they, they thor thoroughly Greek. They worshiped the Greek pantheon of gods, um, Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, all those. But just across the Sea of Galilee, from where Jesus was living. You could almost, if you're on a hillside on the Jewish side, you could see the lights of town on the other side. It's only like seven or eight miles across there. Uh, it's mentioned in Matthew 4.25, Mark 5.20, and Mark 7.31, the Decapolis. So you'll see why we're going there in a minute. So how are relations between Jews and Greeks? Well, Greeks considered circumcision utterly barbaric. And Jews considered polytheism, uh, the Greek very casual view of homosexuality, eating and sacrificing pigs to be an abomination. And it actually went a little deeper than that. There was a Seleucid member, uh, Alexander the Great. So he dies in Babylon after about 12 years. He's, I don't know, 32, 33. His kingdom gets divided up between his generals and after a period of time, there's this Greek king, he's a Seleucid king, and he desecrates the temple in 168 BC. I don't know if that date matches yours, Chuck, but it's probably pretty close. He erected a statue of Zeus in the temple. He sacrificed a pig on the altar, and then he suppressed the Jewish religion. He actually forced Jews to eat pork. You can imagine the reaction to that. In fact, the high priest at the time, there was a, there was another priest that said, well, you know, okay, I can kind of Jehovah, Zeus, that's fine. He went to do a sacrifice. That high priest killed him on the spot. And his sons revolted. On, this is the Maccabean revolt. And so they revolted against the, Jew, uh, against the Greeks. And that's the way things were until about 37 B.C., when the Romans came, and then the Romans took over. So during New Testament times, they're under Roman rule. But under that whole intertestament period, the Greeks controlled things, except for that little period of time during the Maccabees. And they hated each other. So, the crossing. And leaving the multitude, and that's where they're going. They're going over to the Greek side. They're crossing the Sea of Galilee to the Decapolis, to the Greek side. And leaving the multitude, they took him along with them, just as he was, in the boat, and other boats were with them. It would have taken maybe three or four hours. Uh, it's only five and three-quarter miles across to the other side. I like this phrase, just as he was. Because Mark is like, he's saying, this is like at the end of the day, and Jesus wants to go to the other side, just as he was. There's no packing of bags. There's no, it's like you're on a football team and the coach says, okay, we're, these guys were the state champs last year and we got it, you know, they're really tough and uh, there's this big pep talk. But just as he was. And I want to ask you, what was the frame of mind of the disciples as they're getting into the boat to make this trip over to the other side? This Greek stronghold of Hellenism and pagan worship. I really think they felt like they were entering enemy territory. And I really think they thought, this is probably not a good idea. We should not go there. This is an enemy stronghold. And Poseidon, remember Poseidon? Poseidon was the Greek god of the seas. What was his, what was his character like? He was moody. <laughs> moody and 
And when he got moody and angry and irritated, he caused storms and wind and ships were lost. So they, the Greeks spent a lot of time keeping Poseidon happy because they were seagoing people. Well, sure enough, they encounter uh, Mark 4.37, and there arose a gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. I don't know if you've ever been in a boat that took a wave over the bow, and you look around, and it's like, this is not good. So once the boat fills with water, what will happen to it? It'll roll over. <laughs> they always do that. you got to have your mast sticking up, and over it goes. Now everybody's in the, in the water. And within minutes, most of the people in those boats will probably drown, honestly. They're minutes from death. I got a side track here to Rembrandt's painting because I love this painting. So he painted this, it's called Christ in the Storm on the, on the Sea of Galilee, 1633. He was 27 years old. It's just an amazing painting. Stolen, by the way. Hasn't been seen since 1990. Here's a little close-up. You look and uh, half the guys in the boat are like dealing with the storm. There's one man leaning over the railing. Some are appealing to Christ. And if you count, there's 14 people in the picture. Okay, there's 12 apostles, Jesus. Who's the 14th? You see that guy? You see that guy with his hand? He's the only one looking at the viewer. That's Rembrandt. He painted himself. <laughs> he painted himself. It's a self-portrait of him. He painted himself in, in the painting. And... Uh, I kind of love the messaging behind that. You know, it's like he's he's been there, he knows, and he's he's hanging on for dear life. Jesus is is his his pose is kind of interesting too. You can tell the disciples they're they're appealing. They're they're like, don't you care that we're we're going to drown? We're all going to die. And Jesus is like, really? <laughs> I was sleeping so soundly. <laughs> Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Now, I think there's a purpose to that. Why was Jesus asleep? Because it gives the disciples the freedom to fret about the crossing amongst themselves without Jesus, you know, say, are you really talking about Poseidon in my presence? I, I really think that's why he was asleep. Because he's, he doesn't do anything without a purpose. And he's teaching them some things here, as we're going to see. And, of course, sometimes God seems asleep in our worst possible moments in life. He's not, but it seems like that sometimes. So they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And it's not a request for him to do something. It's like... We're going to die. And it's a four conclusion that this is the end. It's over. We never should have come here. Sidon is sinking our boat, and we're all going to die. And being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. Three words. And the wind died down. And then I like this. And it became perfectly calm. Usually when the storm dies down, it takes a while. But it's like, ever been out on a lake, like in the evening when it's like glass? That's how I picture it. It's like glass. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> this is kind of where it gets interesting. And he said to them, why are you so timid? Why is it that you still have no faith? And they became very much afraid. <laughs> and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They were scared before. Now they're really scared <laughs> because Jesus said three words, spoke it into the air, and the wind died down, and it became like glass. They're frightened. Now, I want to key on this word timid because if I were in that boat, I'd have been scared too. And I think everybody else would have been scared. It's a perfectly normal reaction. The boat is minutes from 
probably sinking. You know, you're, it's a desperate situation. But Jesus rebukes their timidity. Why, why is he rebuking them for being timid? Who did they think could command the wind and the sea? Poseidon? Yeah, they thought Poseidon controlled the wind and the weather and the sea. And he just taught them, no, I do. You're in the presence of something a lot greater than Poseidon. Your whole attitude in going over to this enemy side has been timidity. You're afraid to go over there. You think they control it. They don't control it. So, and they came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. It's or Gerasenes, it's kind of hard to pronounce, and the names change over time. You look on different maps and different resources, and there's a lot of different names there. However, it's got to be right there, near the modern-day town of Kersey, and there's a reason for that. Because most of the eastern shore, the Sea of Galilee, is very, it's pretty flat with a lot of beaches. There's only one area right near modern day Kersey that has a steep bank, okay, that ends at the water. Why is that important? Well, you, you know why it's important. There's a steep bank, ends right at the water. Everywhere else, it's like flat. And also, there's the ruins of an ancient Greek village there. And there are many ancient tombs in the caves in the hillside just above Kersey. It's fascinating to see. It's very like porous rock. And if you look at the tourist photos of Kersey, you see the remains of a Byzantine uh, monastery. It was the largest one in Israel, and it was there till like 800 AD. This became like a pilgrimage site, probably due to this incident that we're talking about. And in the background, right above, they have like railings and whatnot where you can visit the tombs. Easy sight of the little town down below. Pretty close. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. What a welcoming committee. This guy shows up. Of course, not by chance. And it's interesting, too, that in the spirit realm, Jesus is heading across, and in the spirit realm, the devil's side knows he's coming, and there's going to be this clash. Sorry that's so small. And he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. I love how Mark inserts this little bio of, uh, of the man. It just kind of pops out of the page at you. He probably obtained it from talking to the locals, right? They're over there, and it's like, it kind of in the aftermath, they're like, who was that guy? And they give him some details. And I, I got to ask you, too, if he can break chains, how did they chain him in the first place? I think they did. he let himself be chained. And then the demons entered in, and just when they thought they had him subdued, <laughs> he breaks those ch chains, pounces on them, terrorizes them, scares them, who knows what he did to them. But uh, he was a character. Why did they chain him? I think the next verse. And constantly, night and day, among the tombs, and in the mountains, he was crying out and gashing himself with stones. So it's 2 a.m., very quiet night, and the wailing starts up in the tombs, and your kids are crying. They're so scared. It makes your hair stand on end. And they all pile into bed with you. What is it? And it's like, it's that guy again. I can't even sleep. And he would do that, and it would, I don't know how long it went on, maybe several years, who knows. But, or you're going up to the tombs to have a dignified burial of a loved one. And in the middle of it, everybody scatters and runs for life because who shows up? That guy. I mean, that would be so infuriating. 
And the men would get together and say, we've got to do something about this. This is unacceptable. That was the situation. He was a plague. His self-destructive behavior is a description of a soul just tormented. <clears throat> and seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and crying out with a loud voice, he said, what do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. It's kind of similar to what the demon said to him in Mark one twenty four. They always like, they recognize him and they run up to him and they, they'll say, what, what business do I have with you? It's very, it's very characteristic. Or he had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion. <laughs> Think about the Roman Legion, thousand soldiers, but we are many. And he began to entreat him earnestly not to send them out of the country. So the, the man was not possessed by just one mean, demon, but many, many, many demons. And for some reason, they do not want to be sent out of the country. I don't know what that means, but they wanted to remain there. Now there was a big herd of swine feeding there on the mountain. And the demons entreated him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Sure, no problem. <laughs> demons can possess animals? That explains our cat's behavior. <laughs> and he gave them permission, and, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. So the swine accomplished what the demon-possessed man could not do. They killed themselves. And who keeps a herd of 2,000 pigs? So I'm from Iowa. I got to brag here. Um, Iowa is the leading pork producer in the United States, about over 20 million pigs a year. The next, number two, North Carolina, only 8 million, not even close. So the average farm in Iowa that keeps hogs has about 3,000, but they go up to like 100,000 and even more. So I got to ask, who keeps a herd of 2,000 pigs? That's a lot of bacon. I have a theory. This is just me. I think those were maybe temple pigs. I think they were involved with the religious worship. It would have taken 100 pig herders to keep an eye on 2,000 pigs. It'd be a huge endeavor. An individual farmer back in that day is not going to have 2,000 pigs. It is much bigger than that. There, there's something going on to these pigs. And they're and it's also interesting, too, that Jesus picks, he knows that herd's going to be there. They pick that spot, the demons go in, and it destroys their whole worship system for, who knows, two years. They can't sacrifice any pigs because they're all drowned in the Sea of Galilee. And their herdsmen ran away and reported in the city and in the countryside. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. Isn't this just like us? Everyone was curious to see what had happened. That, what an amazing story. The herdsmen are like, this guy came. And you know that demon possessed guy? Yeah, he cast. And then the, the and they tell, and people are like, I got to go see this. And they came to Jesus. And they saw the man who had been demon possessed, sitting down, clothed. Oh, clothed. Luke tells us he was naked too. And in his right mind, the very man who had previously had the legion, and look at their reaction, they became frightened. The disciples were frightened out in the boat when Jesus calmed the storm, and now the locals are frightened. Jesus scares people. And I've had this experience, when you talk to people about the Lord, they'll get scared sometimes. It's an interesting reaction. 
Because in their soul, they're like, I just want to live my life. I don't want to think about all those things, those implications. I mean, there's a judgment. I just hope to be nothing after I die. But you're saying there's an afterlife and maybe a judgment? I don't like the sound of that. So those who had seen it described to them how it had, how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the pigs. They, re, they rehashed the whole thing because this is an amazing story and people have gathered around and they're like, what happened here? Can't you just imagine everyone gathering around to hear this story? And they began to beg him to leave their region. Why did they react this way? I'll tell you why they reacted this way. When you watch a movie and the, they do something that makes no sense and you look at one another, what's the answer? Why do they do that? The script. <laughs> the script told them to do that. It didn't have to make sense. They're following the script because they needed to do that. I don't really know why. They, I know they were frightened, but I find it very strange that they begged him to leave. Maybe they didn't want him going after anything else. What's that? The financial hit, yeah. And the, the herdsmen are like, they go back to the owners and they say, so where's all the pigs? Uh, they drowned in the Sea of Galilee. They, what? You know, it's not a good thing. The departure. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was begging him that he might accompany yeah, now this I get. It's pitiful, but I totally understand why he wanted to do that. He has nothing left, and Jesus has changed his life. Think about that man. He has family in that area. There's people he grew up with. He has relatives. They know him. And he's been nothing but a plague for years He's like everyone in the Decapolis has heard stories about this guy. I guarantee it. And he did not let him, but he said to him, go to your people and report to them what great things God has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Now imagine the reaction when he knocks on the door of the family home. <laughs> <laughs> or walks down Gergesa Street and people see him and it's like when the gunslinger comes in in the western they all like dive for cover and they, they close their doors and they, they lock them and kids, the moms grab their kids you know and he's like no no it's fine I'm okay <laughs> and the doors slowly open up and they say Bob is that you? <laughs> or whatever his name was <laughs> George, George, what a story he had to tell. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. No doubt they were. I would be amazed. His transformation was remarkable. I mean, I can't think of a transformation more total in all of the Testament in the scriptures. It's amazing. Their worldview had no explanation for what they could see with their own eyes. Their worldview provided no help for him. And when Jesus healed him, there was no explanation. It didn't make any sense within their whole way of thinking and viewing the world. Imagine how that turns things upside down for you. All right, time passes. Now we're in Mark 7. And again, he went out from the region of Tyre and, and came through Sidon. Uh, he met the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter was demon-possessed. you remember that? Um, to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. He's kind of back where he was before in Mark chapter 5. I don't know how much time has passed, but it's a bit. Uh, he heals a deaf man. And then we have this event. 
In those days, when there was again a large crowd and they had nothing to eat, you remember the story, time, this time the reception is much more welcoming than the last time. The last time they asked him to leave. This time, when they heard Jesus had come to the Decapolis, a huge crowd came out to see him. Why? The apostle to the Greeks had spread the word. A huge crowd forms, and the feeding of the 4,000 takes place. Remember, the previous feeding was 5,000. That was in Israel. And when they're done, they pick up seven loaves. How many loaves was it in the previous one? Was it 12? 12. 12. Yeah, but they picked up afterward 12 baskets. It's like one for each of the tribes of Israel. That was, a, that was a statement of God saying, I will provide to the nation of Israel. Here, they pick up seven loaves. What does seven mean? It's the number of completion. It's like he's saying, now the rest of the world. And they had seven baskets left over. Okay, wrapping up the conclusion. So Jesus' compassion for the lost extends to the whole world. And he can reach anyone regardless of their worldview. And telling others what God has done in your life is your most powerful evangelistic tool. The demon-possessed man didn't go to Bible college, had no theological training, knew nothing of the Hebrew Scriptures. I'm sure he learned a lot after that, and we do too. You know, we polish what we know. But the essential thing, I think, that is the most powerful tool we have is what God has done in our own life over the years that we've known him. You might not have a real dramatic conversion experience. Some people do. This man did. Um, but he works in your life, and he does things. People are interested in that, and you're an expert on it. No one can contradict you and say, no, it didn't happen that way. You're the expert, because it's your story. And that's, I think, really the message of the demon-possessed man, is how Jesus had this, he had this vision for what he wanted to do in this other area, and he just took one person, <laughs> changed them, and let them do the rest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. What an amazing thing that you have given us. We thank you for your son. We thank you for how he transforms the lives of those that trust in him. And uh, he frees us from the things that we're in bondage to and makes us suitable and fit to serve the King. Help us, Lord, to love a, a renewed love of your word and a renewed love for our Lord, to follow him, and also to look for those divine appointments and opportunities that you give us when our paths cross with those that need to know him. In Jesus' name, amen.